to our show. All right. How's everyone doing? I hope well. Can't see anyone except the panelists. Uh, but while we're waiting for everyone to join, uh, we're going to begin with an icebreaker. So this is for the panelists. And then Lady Jane will put up a poll so our audience can also weigh in. So the question is, if you could time travel, what would you want to see? The past, the future, or no thanks, I'm good with the present. So whichever panelist wants to begin. I can I could chime in. Uh, I feel like I should put present because that's probably more healthy, but I really want to see the future. I want to see what's going to happen with everything. So it's my curiosity, you know, so just in general, the future too, about what it would look like. Is it going to look like the Jetsons or, or what? Are we going to be, you know, in spaceships flying around um, more like Star Wars? So that's my, that's my, uh, that's my answer. We appreciate your honesty. Um, yeah, I agree with Anthony. I'd want to see the future too, because I'm very curious and nosy, and I just want to see how everything turns out. I know for myself that I would go to the past, um, specifically because I've always had an interest in um, Egyptian culture and the building of the pyramids and just the way that they lived. Um, so I would definitely go to the past um, just to see all of it. Um, but yeah, I would say the present is much safer because you know we have like a lot of vaccines and you know everything here is <laughs> you know good now, but way back when they didn't you know know a lot. Um, so yeah, I would go to the past though. All right, we have the past, two futures. It's hard living in the present. All right, what does our audience say? So Lady Jane, I'm not sure if I can see the pool, but what was, what's the verdict with the audience? The future, definitely the future. The future, all right. I'd have to agree, I'd say the future as well. Hopefully everyone's um, joined us. So I'll go ahead and get started and just to let everyone know, oh, there it is, the poll just popped up. Okay, so I'll read the, I'll read uh, what the results were. So 24% said the past, 48% uh, said the future, and 28% said, no thanks, I'm good with the present. All right. So just to let everyone know, we're recording today's forum and we'll be streaming on Facebook. So I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gisela Aguirre, and I use the pronouns she, her. I am Integral Care Suicide Care Program Manager. I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's community forum supporting the mental health and well-being of LGBTQIA plus youth. We're honored to be co-presenting Without Youth, which provides Central Texas LGBTQIA plus youth and their allies with programs and services to help them thrive. Integral Care is a designated local authority for mental health and intellectual and developmental disability for Travis County. For over 50 years, we have supported adults and children living with mental illness substance use disorder, and intellectual and or developmental disabilities. Many LGBTQIA plus people face discrimination, prejudice, denial of civil and human rights, harassment, and family rejection. These factors can have a serious impact on mental health, especially for those with intersecting racial or socioeconomic identities. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth experience greater risk for mental health conditions and suicidality, being twice as likely to report experiencing persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness than their heterosexual peers. Transgender youth face even greater disparities and are twice as likely to experience depressive symptoms, seriously consider suicide, and attempt suicide compared to cisgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and questioning youth. To discuss these common mental health challenges faced by LGBTQIA plus youth, what it means to have intersectional identities and how caregivers can create a safe, affirming space, and also to discuss resources for youth and caregivers, I'm honored to welcome our panelists. Our first panelist is GE Loveless, who uses pronouns he, they. 
GE is a project coordinator for Tobacco Cessation Project and the co-founder of Elevate Your Essence. They serve as a board member for Measure Austin and a community advisor for Hearts to Heals. Our next panelist is Kayla Witcher, who uses pronouns she, her. Kayla holds a master's degree and is an LPC associate. Kayla is a youth and families therapist without youth and specializes in working with children, adolescents, and family units. Our last panelist is Anthony Cavazos Deluso, who uses pronouns he, him. Anthony is an LMSW and a qualified mental health professional with integral care. He works on our race team, which provides substance use intervention for individuals 15 to 30 years old with co-occurring substance use and first episode psychosis. Now that I've introduced our amazing panelists, we'll begin with a panel discussion and then we'll move into audience questions for the last 10 to 15 minutes. As best we can, we've incorporated questions we already received into the panel discussion. Please type any questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many of those as we can. And in, in case we run out of time, please include your email so we can follow up with you. We've also dropped a helpful glossary of LGBTQIA plus terms into the Q&A answer section. And I believe that that should be in the chat. Is that right, Lady Jane? Working on it. Awesome. So that is uh, for the audience. You can reference that as needed. All right, we'll begin with question one. Panelists, are you all ready? All right, got a few thumbs up. Okay, so question one. We know that LGBTQIA plus youth experience greater risk for mental health conditions than their heterosexual peers. So Anthony, we'll begin with you. As providers, what kinds of mental health challenges are these youth dealing with? Thank you very much and happy last day of Pride Month. Um, yeah, what a great, what a great question and how significant this is. Um, I took part of helping um, people, young people in um, the LGBT, LGBTQ um, IA community, and then also what it was like for me growing up as um, someone who's gay um, living, you know, when I did. Um, I think that the word that comes to mind is safety, um, making sure that I'm safe as a practitioner, um, so the people that I serve are comfortable enough and feel safe enough to present their true self and to, and to, and to talk to me in a safe way. I think that's basically really sums up how to, to go about that. Be that safe person for, for the individual. Um, make sure that that individual feels safe throughout every interaction. Um, also to just feeling understood and listened to and seen. I think that's a lot of um, challenge, challenges for some people to be able to, to talk to somebody and actually listen to what that person's going through. Even if not necessarily I had gone through that experience um, that that person has, um, I can listen to them and try to understand their point of view and what's going on. I think that's paramount. Um, also, just keeping in mind how the world is. Um, I'm a little bit older than, than probably all of the panelists. Um, so I grew up in a, in a I grew up in the 80s, basically, um, when there wasn't a Pride Month, when there really wasn't any role models to look at. Um, I'm grateful that there is now um, for us, um, but at the same time, um, there's still issues that people face, challenges such as bullying and things like that. So be the person that's um, able to stand, stand with that individual and understand what they're going through. I think. I think that's what I think right now. Thank you, Anthony. And Kayla, as a therapist, can you discuss a little bit of what you see when you're working with uh, this community? Yeah, sure. So a lot of the time what we see is the anxiety and depression brought on by the certain minority stressors that LGBT 
QIA plus community goes through. So um, mostly with our trans youth, they do come in with a lot of dysphoria that we don't necessarily understand if we haven't been put in their position of feeling stuck in a body that you don't really identify with that can come with a lot of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. And so it's really important for us to provide them those resources to make them feel as comfortable as possible. And on the other side, I also work with parents and caregivers of these folks. And we do have a lot of these folks dealing with unsupportive or non-affirming parents and caregivers, meaning they probably don't support their identity and their way of life. Or if they do, they're not very affirming about it. They'll still use the incorrect pronouns or call them by the incorrect name that they no longer identify with. So it is an uphill battle having both of those situations kind of playing a, a significant role in their mental health. Thank you for that input, which brings me to our next question. When it comes to mental health challenges, LGBTQIA plus youth with intersectional identities often face even greater challenges. What does intersectionality mean to you and why is it important to consider? Uh, so Kayla, can you please define for us intersectionality and why it's important? Yeah, intersectionality is something that we always like to keep in mind at Out Youth. So pretty much we all have different identities beyond just male, female, racial identities. We have those gender identities. We have identities regarding race. We also have um, identities regarding sexuality, socioeconomic status, and all things that either aid in our privilege or aid in our oppression. So intersectionality is basically taking your identities and seeing how they intersect with one another and seeing where other minority stressors might come from. And I think that it's important to not just fixate on one identity when especially working with the LGBT community because that's not their only identity. Um, they do, being part of the LGBT community does, does come with a lot of stressors in that of itself, but it is important to look at the other stressors that might be aiding in their mental health as well. Thank you, yeah, I really like that. You know, not fixating on just one identity. So being open-minded, I like that. All right, GE, I'm gonna pick on you now. Can you discuss with us um, your lived experience of intersecting identities? There you go. I was like, where's the button? There um, you are. <laughs> uh, for me, um, I, I always go into, when I think about my intersectional identity, I always think about it as building blocks um, because I always think about, uh, so for me, I grew up Christian and then um, in, in being Christian is then uh, the next building block of me understanding my Black and Afro-Caribbean um, heritage. Uh, and then on top of that building block is my um, sexuality and my gender identity. And so with these different building blocks and also looking at what's going on sociopolitically that affects me. And so with this intersecting identity, um, I've always been um, grateful for the opportunities I've had to learn about my identities and how they intersect more than overlap or clash together. And I think with a lot of LGBTQ youth, um, that's the issue is that there isn't um, more experiences to not only learn about your identity, but be immersed in the culture within that, that, within that identity. Um, for example, one of my friends who is 23 just went to their first Pride Parade um, this month. And they had said they'd never been to a Pride Parade. Um, and I was like, what? I went, my first Pride Parade was when I was 16. And it was a different experience because I got to learn something about my community. I got to meet people who look like me, who spoke like me, who walked like me. Um, and some of them who had the same passions as I did in the, in the same space. And it's important to see that representation because it's, because as we see um, on social media or even in the workplace, it's important to say, oh yes, I see myself in that role. I see myself in that position. I see myself um, doing X, Y, and Z because I see this person doing it as well. 
And I think that's why it's so important that we celebrate intersecting identities and that we also um, enable um, a sense of support for youth who are going through these stages of their identities because being Black and queer can be an issue for an individual whose family um, whose family isn't comfortable with LGBTQQ or isn't, isn't familiar with the community um, or even thinking of anyone of color and being LGBTQ or even being neurodivergent and LGBTQ can serve a lot of um, different challenges as well. Um, so yeah, I think that altogether it's all about celebrating one's intersecting identities because for myself, it's just been a journey and a celebration as well. Thank you, GE. And lastly, Anthony, can you share a little bit about how privilege might play a role when we look at intersectionality? Absolutely. It's something I think about just about, I mean, if not every day, very, very often. Uh, being a gay male, um, cisgender male, um, especially of my, my age again, um, and socioeconomic status. I mean, me and my husband, we own a house, we have two cars. I'm not saying that we're, we're extremely wealthy, but we're doing okay. So there's that, um, being, being white, um, I have white privilege. I walk with that every day, along with my identity of being a gay. Um, and so understanding that when I walk into a space, being gay, it's, di it's different than other people's walking into the same space being gay or identifying as gay. Um, and just understanding that and I don't know, like recognizing it and recognizing how much privilege I have, not by any, any me, I mean, not by any other means than what society gives me right and how i can use that privilege to to help other people in, in our community i think that's that's something that drives me and it's something that really i think i i hold dear to me and i and i and i feel almost there's some guilt there that i have it um but then again right if i want if i want to be able to to change things um, just a little. Uh, I'm recognizing it and I'm, you know, I'm holding it. Thank you, Anthony. How are the panelists doing? All right, thumbs up. We're going to move into our third question. As providers with lived experience, what support do you wish you had as a youth? And Anthony, I know you just gave us a great answer. I'm going to pick on you again. Can you share a little bit about your lived experience? Yeah, um, growing up, like I said, I, I grew up, in, it was in a suburb community. Um, there was, at that time, really no, no role models at all. Um, society back then, and still somewhat, uh, but it was, if you were gay, you definitely didn't tell anybody. Um, it wasn't safe for me to, to tell my parents, um, the community, my teachers, they, there was, there was no one there. And so of course that brought on, there was de depression as, at a very young age, suicide attempts at a very young age, um, feeling that so alone, you know, like the internet wasn't invented yet. <laughs> um, I just, you know, that, that's something that I went through. Um, so I think that understanding that what I went through, it's not that my story is unique at all, um, but here I am, right? I, I have the things I have. Um, I got to be married to the, to the person I love um, back, you know, that it was just eight years ago, actually, two days ago. Um, like, wow, like, so like, hang on, like, we don't know what's, speak about the future. We don't know what that is going to bring. Um, we don't know, but it, I like to, to say it's going to bring better things. So, you know, yeah, like it just, it's, it's, 
it's something where I think that looking at it as a positive um, thing in the future, just just hang out. You don't know what's gonna, you don't know what's gonna be in store, and just wait and see. So keep hanging on. Happy anniversary, by the way. I wish there were clapping hands. I there probably are. I don't know how to work Zoom well. But happy anniversary, and Anthony, we're we're glad that you're here today. Thank you. All right. Audience, I know I've been picking on Anthony, so we'll move on to our next question and I'll let Kayla and G weigh in on this one. So our fourth question is, how can we create safe affirming spaces for LGBTQIA plus youth who are dealing with mental health challenges? Uh, so Kayla, just, you know, as a, as a provider, what is your approach when you're working with caregivers? Right, so I definitely love this question because I really think that it it does start in the home, right? If these kids can't have a safe and affirming space in their own home, then that's going to be like even more of a struggle. So this is why I really like working with caregivers and getting them into more of an affirming space. And a lot of the time I like to start with basically getting their minds beyond what's just in the binary. So they come with a lot of questions about gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, and they come thinking that it's all connected with each other. If you identify as cisgender, then you have to express yourself in this way. So if I identify as um, a female, then my gender expression must be feminine, right? Um, so I try to get them beyond that just because my gender identity is female, I can still have a masculine gender expression. So just trying to get that sort of understanding and also just emphasizing the importance of just not mislabeling, using the correct pronouns, using the correct names, even with all of their confusion and newness of having a child who is LGBT. If you can do anything first and foremost, just use the correct labels and pronouns and names that can go a very long way with their youth and make them feel even more comfortable in their home. Thank you, Kayla. So GE, as we talk about creating safe affirming spaces, um, what is the importance of building a community like that? The importance of building a community like that is Going back to representation, um, a great example is um, for myself, I lead the project with um, Out Youth uh, for Tobacco Sensation, um, which is a collaboration with uh, Out Youth and also Public Health um, to be able to provide uh, resources and tools as well as assisting in uh, developing practices for LGBTQ youth to be able to alleviate their usage of nicotine or tobacco based products. And the, the beautiful thing about this project is that uh, because I'm leading it, I'm able to build a team and also um, able to find uh, youth and young individuals to be able to have their voices included into the project itself. Um, and I think that being able to have youth in leadership or youth be the, representat the, rep the representatives or the ambassadors or the liaisons is important because peer to peer led communities have seen a lot of growth and a lot of impact simply because you have youth leaning on one another, youth learning on, with one another and them being able not to only learn and lean on one another, but it builds that community. Um, and that's the, the biggest thing about building this community is the support. Um, going back to looking at intersecting identities or looking at um, youth who do have mental health challenges. Um, or are going through um, a phase or a chapter in their life where they can be bullied or where they're facing um, microaggressions or anything of the sort. They need to be able to lean on other youth um, or be able to be a part of programs or be a part of a project that is meant for them by them with people who look like them and can represent them on these teams. And so for me, I, I feel like the biggest the biggest component to building community or the most essential thing to building community is being able to have representation on all fronts, you know, in leadership, behind the scenes, 
even in the process and planning, uh, even in the planning phases, because youth need to be, um, need to feel confident. They need to feel comfortable and they need to feel like they have a voice. And the only way that we can have all these things implemented into what we do for you is to be, is to build that community and say, okay, this one young person probably knows three other young people who want to be a part, who would love to do this work. Those three young people may know seven more young people. And it's all about building that network, building that community trust, and then establishing um, the groundwork or the foundation for being able to have youth be able to be leaders and also the creators to what we are designing for them in this community. Thank you. And how amazing um, that you know these youth are able to look up to you as their leader. Thank you for sharing that, G. All right, we'll move into the next question. Anthony, I hope you had a break, so I'm about to pick on you. So our fifth question is, do you have any tips for caregivers looking to find an affirming therapist for the youth in their lives? So Anthony, can you describe to us what it's like uh, during your initial, like your intake session, your initial session with families who are looking for an affirming therapist? Going back to making sure that when I'm working with individuals, I am that safe person for that individual. Um, like, in this, it depends on, on what setting, you know, that the therapist does work, but easily making it a safe place for that individual. And at the same time, if someone's looking as far as a youth getting into therapy, I would really recommend the parent or guardian or caregiver ask a, just tons of, tons of questions of the therapist. Unfortunately, in Texas still, um, conversion therapy is still happening. Um, and so just making sure that the therapist that's working with your, your kiddo um, is affirming and is not going to do more harm than than good. And so don't want to scare you all right now on here. But yeah, that's that's kind of what what I'm talking about. And then too, just in the interactions of, you know, any mental health professional that's working with youth especially, you you would want that affirming safe person. Awesome. And just out of curiosity, what is just one question that you would ask um, a family when they come in for that initial session. Are you affirming? <laughs> what would that look like? Yeah, I mean, and still establishing rapport with, you know, the, the family and, and the individual of, you know, but also just if I was a parent and I was at an intake, I would ask, I would ask if, you know, your viewpoints on LGBTQ, you know, therapy and, and people, you know, and, and people who need help with that. And um, yeah, and background does matter, but at the same time, just where that individual is with affirming, I think that that is, that's the question. So thank you, Anthony. And GE, can you speak a little bit to um, what's in the mirror and a database of affirming therapists of color in Austin? And I'll let you uh, describe the what's in the mirror. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so when I, so just to give context, when I was in high school, right out of, right after I graduated, um, I was a part of three organizations, one of them being what's in the mirror. Um, what's in the mirror, what's in the mirror <laughs> simply works to be able to bridge the gap um, between mental health and creative arts. And with this, they had developed a database um, specifically um, aiming in the greater Austin area, touching Round Rock, Pflugerville, some and Maynard, as well as um, Del Valley. Um, in developing a database where there's clinicians, activists, um, as well as educators, doctors, therapists, um, all into a database that is on their website. Um, and I want to, and one of my kind of projects that I want to take on is being able to expand the database um, because it is important that 
we not only have this database in the city of Austin, but make it um, accessible, um, not only in a digital sense, but also in a physical sense, as um, so that way we can touch all bases with you. Um, but yes, so uh, what's in the mirror developed the database where there are more than 100 clinicians, therapists, educators, and activists housed um, to be able not only to assist people who are underserved, but people who are seeking um, those who look like them to serve them when it comes to um, their medical or healthcare needs. What a great resource, which is a great segue into our next question. Are there any other resources that you think would be helpful for LGBTQIA plus youth and their caregivers? And Caleb, can you share with us if there are any support groups for caregivers or what that would look like? Yeah, definitely. So Out Youth has our caregiver support group for caregivers of trans and non-binary youth. We have those every few months and it's just a place where of course they can come in and get the support from clinicians, but also support from other people in the community that are going through a similar transition as them. So a lot of the time we have caregivers that have been in the game for a while and then caregivers that are um, brand new to this journey. And it's so nice to see them even still, no matter how much experience you've had, they still learn from each other and help each other grow in, in any way, because this journey isn't linear, of course. Like there can be someone who's been in the game for a while, still going through something that someone who may have just started that journey has already been through. So lots of opportunities to learn from each other. And Out Youth also has something called family office hours where caregivers and their families can sign up for an hour long sort of consultation and just get support from our clinicians and resources and just talk about where they're at with their journey and where they seem to be struggling with. Thank you. And GE, can you speak a little bit more to uh, out youth resources and any upcoming events that y'all may be having? GE, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was going to go right into it. Um, you're ready. So um, we have so the project that the project that I'm currently working on without you. We have two different programs running at the moment. Um, one is a certification series um, that focuses on community and wellness. Uh, specifically for LGBTQ youth who are experiencing or are wanting to go through the journey of tobacco sensation as far as alleviating their usage of tobacco and nicotine. Um, with this, they're going to be identifying and managing their triggers, looking at different practices for wellness as well. Um, and then they will ultimately be able to um, build community with these different practices, tools, and resources that they're given. Um, then we are having an event um, on September, I'm so sorry, with the certification, um, we're having, it's a two-part series. We're going to be having this two-part series, one in August, one in September, and then another one in February. And for um, the event that we have, is called um, the Season of Growth and Wellness, um, and this will be on September 18th. Details are still coming to fruition, um, but it's simply to create a celebration for youth um, and uh, for wellness as well. We want to be able to build a community that not only represents youth as speakers, as leaders in this health and wellness movement, but to also be able to bridge the gap between youth, educators, and parents with an event that not only celebrates wellness, but also growth in a sense of self-care, self-love, self-awareness, um, and being able just to be yourself. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so those are the two, the two things that we currently have happening with the Tobacco Sensation Project, um, focus on, um, of course, tobacco sensation, um, uh, subs, subs, oh, I'm so sorry, substance prevention, um, as well as being able to learn more about self-care practices and also um, how to build community with your peers. Uh, and with the drop and with the series that we're doing with the certification, um, that's going to be um, at Out Youth, um, at Out Youth Center, um, which I'm really excited for because I it's going to be my first time going. Um, but those are the two things that we have happening at the moment. As far as resources, 
um, with the Tobacco Sensation Project last with our last event, um, we was able to develop a, a link tree um, that uh, that gives what's the word uh, resources and tools, as well as Facebook groups, Twitter um, Twitter accounts, uh, Instagram pages, even thinking about podcasts or even audiobooks, all on that link tree um, that we developed specifically for youth who are going through the health and wellness journey of tobacco or nicotine cessation. Um, which I believe will be shared, but I can share it into the chat as well. Um, but those are all the resources and events that I have in my brain. Um, well, as thank you for that. As far as any affirming churches in Austin, uh, off the top of your head, do you know any of those? Or I don't know if Lady Jane, if that is something that will be dropped in in the chat. Yes. Yeah, so that's also in the um, in the resource link as well. Um, that I'll be sending soon um, because there's uh, because during the pro during a past project I was working on um, youth were weren't finding safe spaces um, especially when it came to youth who are who do identify as Christian or with a, a religious affiliation and so that's how we developed the list of affirming churches by just going up to the churches understanding their programming their leadership awesome. Well, thank you for that. And uh, for the audience, a link will be dropped into the chat for uh, all these resources that have been discussed. All right, brings us to our last question. If you were to give parents or caregivers of LGBTQIA plus youth one takeaway from this discussion, what would it be? And Kayla, can you emphasize for us the importance of this? Yeah, so we have a lot of caregivers coming in who just have this overall confusion and lack of understanding of what their youth is going through. And, you know, I just like to emphasize that just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, and it's something that you can't really understand unless you're in their shoes and going through the same thing that they're going through as well, you know. So it's important to open yourself up to listening to someone who's actually going through this and not just listening to respond, listening to try and have some sort of understanding of what they're going through. Even if you don't fully understand, it really isn't for you to understand, but it is for you to have that respect for, you know, if someone is really telling you like, this is my journey, this is how it's affected me. These are the pronouns I want to use. This is the name that I want to go by. There may be a lot of confusion, but at the end of the day, it is really important that you do have some respect for their journey and respect for what they want to be called and respect for what they're going through, really. Thank you so much for that, Kayla. All right, well, we have some time now for audience questions. And um, I'll begin with the first question that our audience has. And that is, how can we best support families of LGBTQIA plus youth? And so panelists, I'll give you all a second to think about that and whoever wants to weigh in on that. And I'll reread that question. How can we best support families of LGBTQIA plus youth? I would say for me that I think out youth would be the best resource, especially with the family office hours. Um, and I and I don't know if Kayla can speak more on it. I'm not too familiar on the family office hours, but I know that out youth is a great resource. Um, and I would also say that um, thinking about organizations like Ashwell or Algo or even um, Kind Clinic when it does come to having those conversations about sexual health and wellness can definitely be, those can be other touch points as well um, for families who haven't had that conversation or are, or, are, or are unfamiliar with that territory and how to have those conversations. Thank you, GE. Would Kayla, Anthony, um, would you all like to answer that, how can we best support families of LGBTQI plus youth? 
Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of the time, families who come into our family office hours or our caregiver support groups, they come in sort of feeling down on themselves for not knowing everything there is to know about the LGBT community and everything there is to know about their young person's journey. So I think coming in with kind of like that validation, like you're on this journey too, it's okay if you don't know everything. Um, it's okay if you slip up and use the wrong pronouns sometimes as long as you catch yourself doing it and, <laughs> and correct yourself. But just saying like, you're here at these family office hours, you're here at this caregiver support group. So that means like you're already on the right track. So just validating their own struggles and experiences as well, because they are going through their own separate journey as well. Um, and just making sure that they're feeling validated and that they're not feeling like they're bad parents or bad caregivers for not knowing everything. Absolutely. I wish I could be a fly on the wall at these family office hours. Uh, and just for the audience and for myself as well, uh, what does that look like? And is it just caregivers who are coming into those family office hours or what is that like? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. So it can be um, caregivers, caregivers and their young person or really whoever is a part of that family unit who wants to get the resources and get the information. So um, a lot of different clinicians run it differently. Um, a lot of the time we have it as all of them together and maybe break them up one by one to get certain perspectives. But I do feel like they, they do leave with, of course, more resources and more like validation of their journey. So it is really nice um, seeing, even in an hour's time, seeing them become more relaxed and more comfortable. Awesome. Well, thank you for clarifying and explaining that for us. All right, another audience question that we have uh, is how do we best support LGBTQIA plus youth whose parents don't support them? All right, panelists, this is your time to shine. What do y'all think? Um, it's me again. Uh, I was gonna say that um, I think one thing that I learned growing up, so to give some background to about me, my father, he is a bishop of the non-denominational Christian faith. Um, my mother, she's an evangelist. And even a lot of my family members to my aunt, to my uncle have served as pastors or have worked in some place in the church and so I grew up in as a as a pastor's kid and when I was 17 I learned um I learned the difference between acceptance and tolerance and what that looks like especially when it comes to being able to understand one person's identity um rather than just be on the know of what this person is doing in this world. Um, and for me, my father, he was very accepting of my sexual and gender identity. Um, however, I can say from my, my understanding and what I've learned from those, my, my, my peers whose parents haven't supported them, is that they really just need a lot, a lot of support and community when it comes to one, sexual health and wellness, um, mental health resources, or even therapy, um, as well as thinking about a lot of extremes that happen. A lot of youth are kicked out their homes. A lot of youth are unable to go to school. Um, a lot of youth lose access to technology or lose access to reliable transportation to their jobs. So I feel like it's all about being able to support them in whatever phase and journey that they're going through while being open and honest and while being able to transition um, out of their family home or out into like a into a stable environment. So I'd say for me, it's all about just being there as a resource rather than a reference um, for a lot of youth who are seeking guidance. Perfect with that. I yeah, completely, yeah. But also to add to um, with families that aren't supportive, I think providing just general education um, about you know LGBTQ education, um, just as a, a way to inform and at the same time listen to where that person's coming from, um, because as as y'all, I think we already mentioned, you know that person might need 
some support on for their own issues that's going on therapy or support group thing like things like that just try to try to listen and try to understand their point of view and then provide the education um, that's needed thank you and i also just want to add you know as we spoke in the beginning when we talk about these youth and when they don't have parents who support them, the elevated risk um, of suicidal thoughts and anxiety and depressive symptoms. And, you know, just to kind of highlight what Anthony said in the beginning of this conversation, you know, keep going, right? keep going. And, you know, we have a panelist here who's celebrating their eight year anniversary and eighth year anniversary. And so if we have any youth um, on this call, anyone in the audience, you know, just keep going. All right, we'll get into our next question. How can I best support LGBTQIA plus youth in the school setting, especially elementary school age? I think that it's, um. I think it's all about being able to create those safe spaces for youth inside of the school, if you can. Um, for me, when I was in high school and even thinking about my college experience, um, what made me feel comfortable was just seeing a flag or being able to see signage or being able to see symbols or being able to be welcome and have my pronouns, um, my pronouns respected or my name respected. It makes a big, it, it, I think, and I think that's like the most beautiful thing too, is like when you do see youth who are finding their identities and they're like, oh, I go by they, them pronouns, or I go by she, her, or he, they, or I go by this name versus this name. It, it, it creates a different kind of environment it, it, and it develops a different kind of a confidence with youth when, when you're able to give them that power that they're seeking. And I think that power lies in representation and in, in, in respecting them as they grow and learn more about themselves with their pronouns in their name. Absolutely. How important is it to validate an individual, right, so that they feel seen and heard? Thank you, GE. Does any other panelists want to weigh in on that question? When we talk about uh, elementary school age, how can we best support these youth? Yeah, just um, just to piggyback off of what GE said, like a lot of having them feel safe in that school environment and having that support of the teachers, the principals, the school counselor. And from my part as a therapist, it would be a lot of collaboration with those people in schools. Um, out youth can help with name and gender marker changes or even providing letters of support saying, yeah, please use this person's name and, and pronouns. It's very important in explaining the reasons why it's important as well. Thank you, Kayla. All right, another audience question that we have. Do your organizations provide supports to Spanish speaking families? Yes. Well, <laughs> I, I think for me, uh, I would like to, I know that Out Youth has services um, that are bilingual, but I know for the organization that I work with full time, is, is focused more on youth and entrepreneur education. However, with the project I'm working on with Out Youth in Austin Public Health, I would say yes, that they do have resources um, for Spanish speaking families, but I can't really give a lot of um, detail into what those are, but I can share links. Thanks, G. And I can speak for Integral Care. Um, uh, previously, uh my role was actually a school-based therapist and a crisis therapist and i did work uh, with individuals who spoke spanish and uh, luckily i speak spanish and so i have worked with families who um who needed these resources and also with integral care we do have a language line uh in the case that a therapist or a professional isn't uh or doesn't speak spanish 
So Anthony, I don't know with Raise if y'all if you have any other resources that you want to share when it comes to supporting Spanish speaking families. Yeah, we have Spanish uh, speaking um, people on our team. I think well. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to look at the chat now to see any other questions that audience has put in. Let's see. Okay. We have one. Let's see. So there's a question that states I echo safety and my experience for homeless LGBTQIA plus was one of high risk for violence. Are there homeless shelters specifically for those who identify as LGBTQIA? Panelists, do you know of any um, homeless shelters who, who support this community? Or... Uh, I would say one organization that I know of is the Street, Street Youth Austin that works with homeless youth. But I don't, I'm not really familiar with the programming, but I know Street Austin, Street Youth Austin or Street Austin Youth um, is an organization that works with homeless youth in the city of Austin that I'm familiar with. Thank you. Street Austin Youth. Okay. I don't, but that would be a great thing to have a shelter like that in Austin. So I don't know if any of the shelters specifically, you know, like are informed even, um, maybe that's something we can look into. Awesome. And GE did go ahead and place something in, or a link to in our chat. And also someone else has responded with Life Work Street Outreach as a resource. Thank you for that. All right, uh, Haven for Hope in San Antonio. Thank you all for these resources. The next question from the audience for our panelists, how do you suggest to reconcile pronouns with correct grammar? As a previous teacher, my hardest thing is the they, them pronoun. Any suggestions? May you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Absolutely. How do you suggest to reconcile pronouns with correct grammar? As a previous teacher, my hardest thing is the they them pronoun. Any suggestions? So I would suggest two things. One, you can, so you can, you can do it two ways. One, you could, you could rely on social media like Instagram and TikTok to be able to look at videos. And I'll share, I'll share um, one of my friends because she teaches how to um, learn pronouns, say pronouns, use them in the correct way. Um, and what it means to actually like, you know, approach someone to ask them their pronouns um, versus assuming an X, Y, and Z. So I can share her Instagram. Um, and then two, something else that you can do is do mirror, mirror or mirroring. Um, and this is a practice that I saw at a conference last year where they were able to have youth and adults sit like face you know, facing each other. And they would just practice the pronouns. Like a, the youth would be like, oh yes, for me, I am they, them, but in the singular sense, it's am, which I'm learning now. Um, but it's, it's interesting when you have that mirroring to say, okay, this youth identifies in this way with these pronouns. And they're teaching me about how to use these and the adult with their pronouns will be practicing with the youth, how they say theirs as well. So I will say you can always practice with youth or even um, peers within the LGBT community, find somebody or even people to be able to learn from, or you can just go on Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> I'm going to have to show, you know, my older family members how to download TikTok and Instagram. And, you know, just something that, in, and personally, as 
as a therapist, a habit I've gotten into is referring to everyone as they, them, right? So that I'm not assuming. Um, and so I, we've all heard practice makes perfect. So um, maybe practicing they, them. Uh, so we probably have time for one more question. And the next one that's on the list is, uh, how do you respond when you are working collaboratively to support a youth, but some of those folks, including those in mental health, maintain that being transgender is a phase? Well, um, I would hit them with the facts first. Um, obviously, if they've been going, the, the DSM says if this has been something that's been occurring for six months or more, then it's not a phase. It's gone into like a clinical sort of diagnosis and something that's not going to change. Um, and I don't know if it would be like very affirming to even have someone who considers transgender as just a phase, even like on the team working with someone, my personal opinion, but yeah, just hitting them with the facts first and then like kind of screening, not necessarily screening, but kind of like just asking follow-up questions of like, what their beliefs are and if they really actually feel comfortable working on this case. I like that, hitting them with the facts. Does anyone else um, have input on that question? Yeah, with me, there would definitely be a conversation with that coworker. And then two, I think the first thing I would make sure that the individual, if that person had worked with that individual, make sure that individual doesn't, you know, is okay and not impacted by that individual, um, if that makes sense. All right, before we wrap up, I think we have time for one more question that was just sent over. So let me pull that up. Let's see. Okay, the next question is, how do you deal with the stresses of the negative atmosphere of the current political climate in Texas? And how can parents and family deal with the threats toward this segment of the LGBTQ plus community? I'll read that one more time. How do you deal with the stresses of the negative atmosphere of the current political climate in Texas? And how can parents and family deal with the threats toward this segment of the LGBTQ plus community? And someone in the chat said, Texas is driving me nuts. Me too. I mean, what I can think of, it's the first thing that comes to my head is self-care. Um, when things come on the news and things like that, um, just making sure that we're practicing um, our self-care things and, and coping skills um, on, you know, within us. Um, so I think that's the first thing. And then encouraging people to vote. I would say the same thing as well. Um, encouraging people to vote and learn more about the legislation. So like next year is when the legislation session is um, happening and kicking off. Um, and also learning about community issues. Um, policy is just not um, for the state or the national level. It's happening in with school boards. It's happening with cities. Uh, at the city level and at the local level as well. So getting involved in that way as well. And I'll say when it comes to threats, being able to, I always go back to building community um, because it's always important when building community to find these resources, to find these spaces and to find individuals or groups that can best advocate for you or that you can be able to utilize or leverage as a soundboard for those threats um, and also to find that safety. Uh, I, for me, I, I feel a huge issue um, in the city of Austin or even where I'm at now in St. Marcus is that there aren't enough safe spaces for youth to go to, um, specifically who are LGBTQ. 
So I think being able to not only build those spaces in our homes or our workspaces or in classrooms, but just being able to just enable safe spaces when we see that LGBTQ youth need those spaces um, and then teaching them about what policy looks like and what um, community looks like, um, being able to build that capacity. Thank you. All right. Well, we're coming up on our hour. So for those who submitted questions uh, through the Q&A, please don't forget to include your contact information and our team will follow up. Uh, panelists, before I wrap up, is there any last words that you all want to share? Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Yeah, the last day. Uh, I think the last thing that I can say is the next time that you see um, an LGBTQ youth empower them, say an affirmation or I don't know, do something, just empower them. My last words is just empower the next youth you see. I like that. Thanks, G. Yeah, just continue to take care of yourselves and our LGBT youth and continue fighting the good fight as as hard as it is right now just continue to go and continue to set that example for our youth as well yeah, absolutely it's so important to understand and respect um, our youth and to learn how we can best support the lgbtqia plus youth in our lives it's been a pleasure to share with you our tips our tools and resources to help youth within the lgbtqi plus communities build and maintain mental health and well-being. I personally want to thank all our wonderful panelists for your time and your insight, and especially thank you to everyone who joined us today. When the forum ends, you'll be prompted to take a short survey. Uh, we hope you'll take a few minutes to share your opinion. And thank you all for joining us. And as Anthony said, happy Pride.